Hello and welcome to The Home Room Extra Time. I'm joined by James Beaumont, who's here to talk about every young boy's dream, becoming a professional footballer and then having that uh, nightmare of being released. You may not recognise James, but he's played and trained with some of the biggest names in football. He's trained with Aston Villa, Chelsea, Manchester United, and the likes of Beckham, Scholes, Hullett and Zola. James's football life started at nine under the tutelage of John Carver at Newcastle United. He had contract offers from every major club in England and then went on to sign professionally with Newcastle. So James, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, can you tell us what it was like as a, as a nine-year-old um, sort of realising your dream and joining Newcastle? Um, I think that's difficult to put in words because it was such a long time ago. Um, when I was so young, it was kind of just going to play football. Um, obviously, Newcastle United is a massive club in the North East, being a North East boy. Um, but I had a great connection and you know, great pride in, you know, in, the, in the classroom and on the playground. So, but it, was very, it just seemed very normal. Um, you know, some, some great times in you know, Newcastle. You know, the coaching was obviously a step above from you know, school or boys' club. Um, so how did you how did you get seen by Newcastle? Were you playing you play at age eight or seven? Yeah, yeah, and it's it's all done through boys clubs. You know, it's, it's traditionally that's how it's how the clubs scout. It's changing slightly because the clubs go younger and younger. It's almost eradicated boys club football. Um, but generally speaking, um, you know that's where I was scouted there for Martin. Um, you know, I have a rich history. You know, producing good good players, Woodgate, Downing came through there. So, so you know, it's, it's a place that scouts you know went to watch. And you know, can you can you tell us about your um, your development? So, you know, you, you started age nine. And what was what was the setup at that point? What what, what did you do? Uh, I mean, again, very different from how it is now. Um, at Newcastle, for example, I was eight or nine. It was a sports hall in Little Ben. With a guy called John Carver, who's now you know one of the you know best respected coaches in the Premier League, um, a lot of technical training. Um, again, you know, what was the focus for those for the training? Very sessions? very technical, you know, touch, you know, awareness, um, and again that was like the base skills, you know, that you need to <coughs> to be, that you need to be a footballer. Um, so that was that was my memories of that, you know, the small side of games. Um, again, it was basic. You know, it was a basic uh, sports hall, not like it is now. Uh, but but that differs, you know, at, you know, places like Aston Villa. Uh, you know, they're all very, you know, very technical coaching sessions. Obviously, as the years went on, it went from slightly small side games to bigger and things change. But again, you just go, you know, just go with the mix with it. You just play football. It's, you know, from I don't know what your earliest memories are, but I can't remember. I thought the same as yours. Much, much before seven or eight, and that's when I kind of went into yeah. the system. So, how was it as a nine, ten year old? Do you, and maybe a little bit older, how did you, did you come to the attention of the likes of Villa and Chelsea and, and again, Man United? Again, it's you know, the scouts everywhere. You know, everywhere you play, school. Well, I didn't play school, district, county, for Newcastle. The scouts from all over. Uh, and my dad took took the stance that, you know, I was a young boy, there was opportunities to go to other clubs. So I never fully attached myself to Newcastle, which gave me, you know, allowed me to go and experience, right. you know, Chelsea, Aston Villa, you know, I just went to Swiss holidays in Man United. All good experience, all, you know, you know, rounded, you know, my game, giving me different experiences, but also, you know, off-field experiences, you know, like you said in your introduction, you know, watching Beckham train, you know, going out to Chelsea, being in the change room when Zola and Hullet were in there. Uh, you know, they were great, great memories, and, you know, you know gr great times that I wouldn't have experienced if I had just, you know, yeah. signed straight away. You know, so. Was there a point when um, you started to feel any, any pressure I think there's always pressure. I, I can't remember playing sport when there hasn't been you've got to play well in. Which granted looking back it must have been you know, ground me down a bit, you know 
Because you're a nine, ten year old boy, yeah. eleven, and you yeah. know you, you, know, you must know that you go into big clubs. Yeah, you know, yeah, with Newcastle, with Man U, with Chelsea. I mean, how do you feel under pressure? I'll be at school on a Friday, you know, nervous and you know anxious about the game tomorrow. Not, not that I wasn't confident I would perform, but knowing that I had to perform, um, especially like around 13, 14, you know, when I was not far away from signing contracts. Um, you know, these were key times for me. And when you think of it, and I look at 14-year-olds now who don't play football, don't play sport, you know, it's a very relaxed time, you know, I enjoy the time. I had great experiences and I you know, an unbelievable education on and off the field um, through my experiences, but there was certain pressure. So between the ages of 9 and 14, you, you aren't attached to a club, you can, you're free to to have trials and, and play for different teams. Yeah, you, can, you can't do that now. Um, but it was slightly different, you know, back then. It sounds, you know, a long time ago. How long were we talking just to give people an idea when you say back then? When I was well, what would that be? Twenty eleven. Now you've got to be attached, and that's great because every club, you know, especially with the age could be um, you know, the category one or two of states clubs, you know, it's all fantastic. It's going to need some coaching, but you know, my dad was open minded and knew that there was, you know, yeah. falls, and you know, at fourteen, I might be back playing boys for football, and the opportunity to go to Chelsea, you know, places like this might not be there. So you want to be, you know, to experience. Every Thing offer. Um, so, you, so you think it's it's better to? You know, I think you said you know, it's better to have an attachment to one club as it is now rather than the, the, the freedom of movement. It, it just the way it is. Uh, you know, a twelve-year-old now is worth you know it's worth money, um, and the recruitment is getting younger and more you know intensified. So you know you won't be allowed to float around clubs if you if you move clubs. You know, there's a fee involved. Um, it's just, it was a bit of a unique case, you know, which wasn't ideal at times, you know, I didn't, you know, didn't set up into a routine with one particular club, apart from really Newcastle for those first couple of years, but again, on the, on the plus points, I've got some great experience. So before um, EPPP came into place, am I right in thinking that, you know, you played for a boys club and then, you know, t you know teams like Newcastle had a school of excellence or an academy that you you know, would sign for is that how it was? You no, know, the academy system was in place um, from, a, I was about maybe 12, 13, I remember coming in, into place, and it's how it worked, it's like this chart for quality. Um, again, the dates might not be uh, correct, but this came in and that's where, you know, training grounds got developed, there were specific coaches uh, focused on, you know, nutrition, dietitian, you know, sports, um, you know, therapy, and, you know, it became very technical and yeah. intricate. Uh, the EPPP has just come in kind of replacing the old academy system that yeah. was, you know, in some eyes deemed a failure, in some eyes deemed, you know, like it, it did a great job at the time. Yeah. And, you know, this, you talked at the start about facilities being different at, at, at clubs um, in terms of standard, but how, how important, you know, would you say the human touches? So, the coaches that you worked with and their communication skills and working with young players like yourself. That is, you know, that's absolutely key for me. Uh, I mean, West Ham didn't and still don't have um, a great training ground, but look at the players they produced, you know, in that era, you know, Carrick's and Coles, you know, very, you know, very technical, very, you know, very gifted brilliant players. Brilliant yeah. players. Do you think that's down to the people who work well, yeah, yeah, the yeah, absolutely. And that was a place, you know, where boys wanted to go because they knew they'd get looked after, they'd get cared for, they'd get, you know, they'd get a chance. You know, again, I didn't really have experience, you know, at that young age of, you know, coaches that didn't, you know, have that, have that touch. But obviously, you know, there is clubs that don't produce players and there's reasons for it. Do you say that, or is there an argument to say that, you know, there is a certain standard facility that you need, but sometimes if you had world-class facilities but without the right people working in them, the youngsters can't can't develop or see their full potential. Yeah, maybe maybe I'm old school now, um, but analysing a nine-year-old, ten-year-old training session one-to-one -one after after a training session is absolutely bizarre and totally over the top. You know why? 
why is that needed? Surely you invest more, more of the time and the money in you know, resourcing a technical coach, you know, getting them, get them out on the grass. So I think they've gone overboard with that. At the end of the day, it's, you know, a pitch is a pitch, you know, there's not a lot you need with football. Um, but coaching is obviously key. Um, you've, you've written a, a thesis or a dissertation on your, your experience and, and your journey. Um, in there you talk about how you were playing for uh, the, the Newcastle under-17 side. I think you won the, the league that season and you were, I don't want to embarrass, you got a star player within that, within that side. Um, what, what kind of happened from there? During there the, the I mean, first team? you know, star player, that's, you know, an opinion, but, you know, there was a, a group of very talented players there, uh, and I was just part of that team. Um, a few things changed. Again, it was, uh, the coach that was, in, that was employed at the time moved on. Um, new coaches came in, had a new philosophy, new ideas. And at the time, you know, I took this very personally, things changed, the way they want to play changed. And as I got older, I realised that that's just football. Um, and I didn't think like that at the time. So, you know, I left the club under a cloud, which I regret, but it's, you know, it's something at the time, uh, maybe a bit of bad, bad advice, but um, at a senior level, I just saw my, you know, my route to the first team blocked, you know, there's a lot of big signings, uh, multi-million pound signings. And you, since, who, who are they? But the likes of Jermaine Jennings, you know, a fantastic player, Milner, you got Bayana, you know, these were, you know, these were well-known names, but similar age, uh, were obviously ahead of me, and ahead of me in, you know, the club's eyes. And this, you know, this was a great frustration to, to not only me, but to my colleagues. Um, but that's just the game, and that's what I, I realise now, that, you know, it's such a doggy dog industry. The standards are so high. Um, and, you know, I, I felt I had to move on. Maybe I moved on too early. Maybe I, I, I pushed for it, and like I say, a bit of bad advice, but um, I went to Nottingham Forest who, you know, had the philosophy and had a, a man in charge who I wanted to be, you know, very much a part of, Paul Hart, and where, you know, the likes of Janice and Dawson had come through, where the academy was very much a part of the first team, you know, you were given a chance, and I jumped at the chance to join, you know, that in Forest. Um, and again, you know, looking, looking back, you think, you think you, you know, you're very grown up, and you know, you know the world. I was like 18. I was really, I was clueless uh, going into a, you know, a senior football world. I wasn't quite ready for. Yeah. And I reckon it took me, it knocked me back about two years. Uh, whilst you were there. Yeah, whilst I was there, I didn't settle. I was. My game was all over the place. Um, at the time, three months into it, four months into my move there, Paul Hart uh, got sacked. So the whole philosophy and the, the reasons for me going to the to Nightmare Forest gone out the window. It changed so completely. It was, Hart, it was Paul Hart the man who signed you? Yeah. yeah. And you were, a, you were a midfielder, we should, yeah. should tell people. Um, what, you know, what type of midfielder did he? Yeah, well, I, I was, you know, other people said I was, you know, a technical ball player. Uh, you know, not not the biggest, not the strongest, but I could play. You know, no doubt about it. Um, and you know, again, going back to my time at Newcastle, not every manager wants that type of player. Um, and I soon became clear that it would be a certain type of manager who'd play me. So that's what attracted you to Forest. Is they were known, as you say, for a philosophy of. Passing the ball, yeah. passing the ball, and yeah. playing football, and, and, and as much as anything, you know, the, the young lads got in. You know, they wouldn't go and sign. You got Bayana for eight point five million. You know, they were league below, but they had, you know, limited resources. But their main resource was the academy, which I, you know, which I joined. So, is is there an element of saying that success and sort of making it to call it that is is down to to luck and circumstance as well? Because you. You need a manager who believes in, in youth and nurturing talent rather than someone who who needs to sign a big name. Is that is yeah, that I think, it's, it's, I think it's a mix of both. Um, I mean, some players, you know, you look at Rooney, you made it at whatever club you would be being at. Um, if you look at Liverpool, for example, now I think their manager's gone on the record to say that he believes in youth and he wants to bring through you know, yeah. some of the academy players. Exactly. Um, I mean, look at Raheem Sterling, Andre Wisdom. Would they have played in the Premier League this year? Davies was still involved. No, 
they've been playing on the side once, but they've missed out on massive experiences, uh, massive games, learning curves, you know, they've been playing for 20 people, for the 20 ones. So yeah, massive luck, changing manager. Uh, so, but, but the manager has to believe, you know, in the, you know, the players below him, and the, in the academy and the manager have got to be on the same, on the same page, or else it's not going to work. In, in your experience, you talked earlier about you know twelve year olds being analysed one on one. What's what's your take on um, sort of the academy systems of youth football now? Is it what, what's being done well? What do you think should change? Um, I think a lot of things have been done well. You know, there's a lot of people in the academies, but a lot of hard work yeah. to make sure that it's a you know a fantastic experience and every, the boys are given every opportunity to succeed, whether they stay at the club or. You know, go and get a career outside of that club. You know, they've got a brilliant grounding in education in football. Um, so uh, yeah, I think a lot of things are done well. Again, a lot. Of, you know, you look at the facilities and everything that's on offer from psychologists to analysis yeah. to, to travel. It's almost like they get the boys are exposed to too many nice things, and maybe I was part of that as well. Yeah. Too many nice things too early on. Uh, I mean, a lot of you know, senior ex pros. Um, you know, I'm constantly saying that's oh, too easy. You know, the boys aren't doing this, the boys aren't doing that. And in a way, they're right, but that's just the changing times. Um, I mean, the, the article in the paper recently, a 17 year old at Chelsea will be a millionaire by the time he's 19 if he never kicks four again. That might be a surprise to some people, but it's just the way it is. Um, and I think it would take, you know, some drastic measures to change that. Um, but coaching wise, you know, you know, there's a there's a specialist coach at nearly every every age group, along with the coach, of brilliant facilities. So you know, the boys are being exposed to you know the very best. You, you, you know, there's obviously a lot of money in the game now compared to you know, the, the short time ago that, that you were you were playing. And um, do you think that, or are you seeing that you know youngsters today that are coming through age 10, 12 are more concerned with the financial rewards of the game? Rather than you know the, the dream and the buzz of playing you know for twenty fifty thousand people, I think some are, and that that's probably always been the case if you look okay. back over time. Um, and again, with you know with, with TV, social media, and everything that you know the, the players are on the front and back page of every magazine and newspaper and iPad. App, you know it's hard to escape that, but that again that's just the you know the modern world. Um, and if one club isn't going to pay a 16-year-old £2,000 a week, do you know what? There'll be a queue of four or five other clubs that will. Yeah. So there's no escape from it. And we, obviously we've spoken a lot about systems within uh, academies and the setup, but how important is um, you know, the outside world, so parental support and family and friends, how, how important is Yeah, that? I think it's massive. I mean, I, I was very lucky, you know, my and dad were you know, very grounded, and, you know, very open-minded to to all of this, not that I knew at the time, but looking back, they obviously were, you know, various decisions, uh, didn't get them all right, but, you know, I, I, had a, I had a brilliant backing from them. Other parents, you know, see see the lights and see the, you know, the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, yeah. so to speak, um, and they do get carried away with it. I mean, my role now in sports marketing, you know, I see it, you know, you see it at games, you see it especially the international level, you know, we're watching the son, you know, play for England in the 16s, and the way they behave, it's so detrimental to the to the child. It's unbelievable, but they, just, they get caught up, you know, in the circus of it all. And you know, the likelihood is 16 playing on Sky with a boot deal and a pro contract at 19. You know, they're out of the game. They're not league, and and again, this this, you know, the academies and the um, the PFA and everything have a you know fantastic support yeah. for when you know the lads are spat out at the end of the system if they're not good enough. Um, but because they've had such a brilliant upbringing from eight nine being the academies with the best facilities, the best this and the best that, then going from that to you know Tramia, Dagenham, and Redbridge, it's a different world. It's a different world, and, met, and, and few adjust to that. Yeah, so it's not it's not necessarily about that the finance is about whether they can maintain the hunger to play. Yeah, absolutely. And you've got, you know, you go back to your early point with the, the pressure. You know, at 1920, 
effectively if I had 10 years of working pressure, some of them are just, you know, I don't know, they want to change. Um, and, you know, you know, operating in League 1, League 2, the conference, you know, it's a tough gig, it's not a Premier League, it's, it's tough going, it's a tough, yeah. tough industry, you know, with senior, senior players there, have got families, got bills to pay for, you know, they'll do anything, you know, to get on the pitch, get the bonus money to play, to earn a new contract, you know, they're up against, you know, some, you know, strong, strong competition. Yeah, and, I mean, I don't want to digress, but a lot of people talk about, you, know, you mentioned senior players there, a lot of people doubt that you know if there's a guy sat on a bench in 50, 60, maybe double that um, a week. How how does that how does that feel? Do you think is that do they have still have the same desire or what the senior they, player? Yeah, does the, I'm not sure. Yeah, again, each circumstance is different, but you know, a guy in late twenties sitting on the on the bench at 40, 50 grand a week. You know, I don't think he's got many worries in his life, has he? Um, but you know, at the other end of the spectrum, someone ten years younger. You know, they want to get to there, um, and and the guy who's on that at that age, you know, he's obviously put the work in earlier on in his career to deserve that. Um, I'm sure people in in every industry, you know, they have weeks, months, years where they're just coasting along. You know, it's human nature. Um, so footballs attract a lot of criticism. Yeah, that, they do, they? but the the clubs give give them the contracts that they're not forced to. Yeah. Um, so that's where a lot of people think that. Forms really fail for me, but again, is that something you can see happening? No, I can't because at the time of signing, you know, there'll be another, there'll be a better offer, you know, if that came in, unless it was across the board, it's never going to happen. Based on your experience as a nine year old through to say 17, 20 um, years old, and, and how the systems are, new systems are now, have you seen a change from um, ability? To being an athlete and then back again to, to more of a focus on ability, or is there an English way of? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think certainly now. Again, I don't know if it's the Barcelona effect that everyone keeps talking on about. You know, small technical players. You know, that's how you started, as you said, the small tech. Yeah, yeah. But then as you move through your, yeah. you know, your career to set. Say seventeen, did it shift towards being yeah, an athlete and strength and abso- power? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the English game changed and the Premier League changed. You know, uh, it's got quicker, stronger, bigger, faster. There's very little room for you know, you know, the ball player or the technical player. Obviously, of outstanding ability there is. You know, David Silva, you know, isn't the biggest. You know, great player in Nasri. You know, very similar. Uh, but again, that's where you just got to adapt. You know, whether I didn't adapt, you know, is obviously uh, is obviously the case. But it, it certainly changed. I remember, you know, maybe 15, 16, 17, You know, it, it became you know it became imperative. You know, to be quicker, to be stronger. Um, and you know, that's how the Premier League's going. The Championship. If you watch a Championship game, you know, it's a million miles an hour. Uh, but certainly, you know, in academy recruitment now. Um, you know, you look at the likes of Chelsea and Man City. They're not going for the biggest players, they're going for the players with the most ability, you know, from Spain, Italy, France, wherever they come from. You know, they see a room for them. Yeah. So as you know, someone who's positive about his experience rather than, than bitter, I remember reading in your um, your dissertation about um, how he just enjoyed the the experience you had rather than looking back now thinking I didn't make it as a pro. Yeah, I think at the time, you know, totally opposite. You know, the disappointment on leaving Newcastle was incredible. Um, you know, the, the dark times at Nightmare Forest where, you know, there were certain managers I wasn't playing at any level, you know, for various reasons. It was incredibly tough. I'm not quite sure how I came out the other end to be honest. Um, but on reflection, again, being in you know the normal world, you know the working world, and you know again the grounding from my parents, you know, it can only be a positive. You know the experiences they had, uh, which were put it this way, far better than my friends who were at college. You know, I was traveling around the world playing football. You know, well paid, brilliant experiences, uh, first class training. You know, everything really in the grand scheme of things was a great experience and do you know from the bad experiences you know 
maybe I've become stronger and, and it's made me adapt, you know, to you know the, the real world which yeah. is out there outside of the Premier League. So you took those experiences and then yeah, after leaving football you went to university, is that right? I actually when I was at Nottingham Forest, again, the another you know thing that really is in the real world is you know the working day. Um, so I had you know afternoons off and I wanted to utilise my time. Um, I realised that you know, maybe I wasn't going to, you know, earn enough money to be able to retire at 30 and so on, you know, relax. Yeah. Uh, so I enrolled on a, on a degree course, you know, I had good GCSDs and A-levels, um, which was sports media and journalism. And, you know, I, I relish, you know, that, that change, you know, it gave me a totally different outlook, outlook on everything. Uh, and it almost gave me a backup plan. So I began to enjoy my football more because yeah. there was many less pressure. And I think in the last you know, 12, 18 months of Forest, I played my best football and I've done that in the beginning of my contract. You know, I won't be sat here now, that's for sure. Um, so university, you know, was was great. I was with all other ex pros but yeah, I did work experience at newspapers, television, radio, went out to London, you know, worked in the Wisdom Cricket magazine. And you know, it, gave me a taste, you know, that there was life, you know, away from football and that gave me, you know, great heart and, you know, get great confidence, you know, that this, you know, if this wasn't what I wanted to do, if I didn't want to go and play somewhere I didn't want to, you know, that I had other options and through that experience at university and the contacts it opened as well as, you know, my contacts within, you know, that I yeah. gathered whilst I was playing, you know, I, I all, all of a sudden, I had three or four different options, one of them being football. So if you could give a, a message to, you know, an eight, nine year old now who's who's about to start the dream of becoming a professional player, what, what would you say to them? It's it's a bit of a cliche, but just embrace everything, enjoy everything, take you know, soak everything up. Um, it might end in two years, it might end in fifteen years, but take you know, take everything as a positive. And I think you know, at that young age, you're influenced very much by your parents, so it, it probably isn't a message to the to the nine year old. It's to the parents and just you know, enjoy. You know, like it could be on the park. You know, playing for the local boys club, putting the nets up. They're not. It's you know, everything's laid out beautifully for them at the at the club. So just just enjoy it and just just embrace everything. Well, James, um, it's been incredibly interesting. It's very uh, brave and kind of you to, to, to share your personal Pleasure. story. Um, so I'm sure there's, there's lots of people, uh, youngsters, parents, um, who've taken a lot from your openness. Um, so thank you for watching The Homeroom Extra Time. Um, if you've got any questions or comments about the show today, uh, please send them to Umbro on Twitter using the hashtag The Homeroom.